Hello! Um, today I'm going to talk about Theorems for Free, which is also the title of a seminal paper by Philip Wardlaw. In this paper he describes how we can just take a look at the type signature of a Haskell function and then just by this type signature you can derive a bunch of theorems about what this function can or cannot do and how it relates to other functions. And the nice thing about this um, procedure is that you don't actually need to look at the implementation of the function. You only need to take a look at the type signature. Of course, um, this requires some heavy underlying mathematical machinery. Uh, so here on the slide, we have the two relevant people. So on the right hand side, that's Philip Wardlaw. Um, some of you might know him as one of the creators of Haskell. And then we have on the left side, we have John Reynolds, uh, who is a mathematician and logician. And uh, he described the theory of parametricity, which is um, basically something about types and sets. Um, and Philip Wardlaw then took the theory and developed the themes for free concept from that. And in this talk, I would like to retrace all of these steps, um, going all the way back to the necessary prerequisites from set theory and how we can take all of these ideas uh, and apply them to Haskell in the end. But of course, first we need to talk about sets. And um, don't worry if, you're, uh, if, if you don't know anything about set theory. Uh, I'm going to try to introduce everything uh, that's necessary in this talk. Now, set theory is uh, pretty foundational in, in mathematics. And it basically describes um, uh, how we can uh, perform uh, logical conclusions based on, on sets and their elements. Um, the idea is that pretty much everything um, is a set. So uh, one example that you might know would be the set of natural numbers. Um, so it's a, a collection of all the numbers starting from zero, one, two, and so forth. And interestingly enough, a natural number like zero itself can also be described as a set. So this is what I mean by everything is a set. So basically you can think it sets all the way down until you reach the empty set and then you can build stuff based on that. But for now, just imagine that you have some kind of objects that you know, like the natural numbers, and you can put them into some kind of collections, uh, and we call those collection sets. Um, importantly, um, a set is not necessarily ordered, so the elements can appear in an arbitrary order there, but you cannot have the same element twice. That's uh, forbidden in a set. Um, you only have, at most, one element. In a set. But sets can also be infinite, as you can see here for the natural numbers. All right, so now that we have sets, we can talk about functions between those sets. So on this slide, I have two sets. Um, I have a source set that contains colored shapes, and I have a target set that contains just colors. And we can take a look at a function between those two sets, and that function would map a shape to its color. So for example, we have the red triangle and this red triangle maps to the color red, of course. Uh, we have the uh, yellow rectangle and that maps to the color yellow, of course. Um, we see here some interesting properties of functions. Um, so for starters, uh, the same source element can only map to one target element. So it cannot be the case that you have one source element that maps to multiple target elements. Uh, and here it's obvious because uh, the way we've structured the source set, uh, every shape has at most one color. So uh, there's a red triangle, it's not red, yellow mixed or something like that. Um, and that's an important property of functions. Um, at the same time, it is not necessary that every element in the target set uh, is somehow reached by the function. So we have, for example, the color blue here in our target set, but we have no blue shape in the source set, and that's fine. Uh, that's a perfectly fine function. Um, as long as it satisfies this kind of uniqueness property, we are all good. And uh, furthermore, we can even describe such functions as sets themselves. And a function is basically a set that contains pairs, and every pair is um, the source and the target. So here we have uh, a set that contains the pair red triangle to color red, then we have the yellow rectangle to color yellow, and so on. And we can describe these functions as sets also. Now, what if we would want to map one source element to multiple target elements? What if we 
uh, don't like this restriction. Well, we can do that. Um, it's just the case that then we can't call it functions anymore. So then we have to call them relations. And relations are sort of like generalized functions. So we can do pretty much arbitrary things. We can map anything to anything else, uh, no matter the um, amount of things that we map. Um, I have another example here on the slide. So we have three people, Maria, Peter, and Astrid. And uh, in the target set, we have three means of transportation. We have trains, cars, and planes. And then the relation between those things describe which means of transport are taken by this person. So Maria, for example, here, uh, she takes the uh, train and the car on her journey. And we can do that in a relation. We can just map Maria to two things. Uh, Peter, on the other hand, uh, only takes uh, the airplane and Astrid only takes the train. So you can see you can have arbitrary combinations of source and target. And same as for functions, we can describe relations on sets also as sets. So the relation and the convention is that we call them with an uppercase letter. Um, we have here a set that contains the tuple Maria train and Maria and car and so on and so forth. So in, in that sense, um, relations are um, just sets that contain pairs of two different sets, the source and the target, and functions are then relations with, additional, with an additional restriction, namely that you have to have a unique mapping from source to target. That's, uh, that's about it. Okay, so now let's talk about abstraction. And abstraction is something that we do in our day-to-day -day lives as programmers, uh, we like to abstract over nearly everything. Um, there's nothing we hate more than concrete code. Um, so we try to, of course, pull out some kind of abstractions. Um, however, if I ask you what is actually the definition of an abstraction, um, that would be quite hard to define. And um, in this talk, I'm trying to give a definition uh, that's sort of geared towards the theorem for free concept. Um, and um, this is kind of a mathematical abstraction mechanism that we are dealing with here. So let's make this concrete. Um, if you remember any kind of uh, lecture on algorithms, you will probably have heard a lot of different algorithms on graphs and on uh, whatever other data structures. And all of these algorithms are just described in pseudocode. And um, the nice thing about pseudocode is that everyone has their own dialect of pseudocode, but uh, the point here is that it's an abstract definition of an algorithm. So you don't, you can't just copy paste it into your IDE and click compile and run it. Um, you need to somehow translate it first. And it's not just that the syntax is somehow abstracted away from a particular programming language, but it's also the case that we use mathematical data structures here, not kind of programming data structures. So here, this is um, some, some algorithm example I took from a LaTeX package. Um, it's some kind of algorithm on graphs. So G is a graph and then uh, V of G would be all the nodes in that graph, all the vertices. And then we say something like for all of the vertices in this graph, do something, right? So we don't really need to uh, uh, define here if this is some sort of a map function or for each function or for loop or whatever, we just say, well, for, for all the nodes in this uh, in this graph, just do that stuff. And then we keep, keep going on. And the nice thing about this is um, if I define this algorithm in pseudo code, um, I don't have to care about all of these implementation details of programming languages. So I don't need to decide, is this a hash set now? Is it a list? Is it an array? It's just sets. So we kind of, um, use the property of sets that you don't have duplicates, that it's not in any particular order. You write the algorithm like that and uh, maybe you do some proofs on it or whatever. But the point is you don't need to care about all these nitty gritty implementation details. Okay, so that's fair enough. Uh, that's probably what some kind of algorithms textbooks is telling you, but now uh, we need to implement those algorithms at some point, right? So we can't actually run the stuff that's written in textbook. Um, so let's say we want to implement this algorithm I've just showed you. And let's just say we only have a programming language that allows lists. Or, I mean, it doesn't matter. Just let's, let's say we want to implement 
these abstract sets using concrete lists. Um, so in Java, that would be, for example, array lists, or in Haskell, just the built-in list type. And um, in the following slide, I'm going to use some kind of mixed mathematics and Haskell notation, but uh, I will try to explain it, so please bear with me. Okay, so what we can do is we can define a function that abstracts away from lists to sets. And this is kind of a connection between the concrete programming language layer and the sort of abstract mathematics layer. So the function takes something concrete that can be represented in memory um, uh, in, in your computer and then returns some kind of mathematical object. So this function that I'm showing you here, you cannot implement it in Haskell really because uh, there's no way to represent these kinds of infinite sets. It's um, merely a connection between your concrete implementation layer and the idea layer, so to speak. And by convention, this kind of abstraction function is always called alpha. So how do we define alpha? Well, if uh, we put an empty Haskell list into alpha, we get the empty set back, right? Because the empty list does not contain any elements. But if we uh, put in a list with a head and a tail, so an X and an axis, what we do, we do, we call alpha recursively to just get the set of the tail, and then we add the X element to it. And, um, Keep, please keep this in mind. This is a function that we are going to uh, need um, uh, for, for a while in this talk. So this is really uh, important. Um, also keep in mind that you have this list of A, which is a concrete Haskell thing. And then you have the set of A in the signature that uh, is kind of an uh, abstract concept. Okay, let's take a look at some examples. Uh, if we call this alpha function on the list one and two, uh, we get the mathematical set one and two back. Um, and if we flip around the order of the elements in the list, or we add um, duplicate elements in the list, we get the exact same set back, right? So um, I told you that in a set, uh, there's no particular order and stuff cannot be duplicated. So for both of these calls of alpha with different, even though they are different lists, so in Haskell they would not compare equal, you would get back the same abstraction. And that's kind of the point, right? So in, in many algorithms, um, we, we don't care about these kinds of things, but in the implementation, of course, uh, there needs to be some sort of order because of memory layout or whatever other kinds of issues. Okay, so we can also now describe some kind of operations we can do both on the um, concrete implementation layer and on the abstract mathematical layer. Okay, so um, let's try to decipher this diagram here. Um, we have on the bottom left, we have an axis, which would be a concrete Haskell list. And on the uh, top left, we have a set S. And what this arrow means is that S is the abstract representation of this concrete axis. So if you uh, put axis into the alpha function, you get this set S back. Then we have uh, two arrows going from left to right. Um, the bottom arrow is the function G. So it's a concrete Haskell function that takes a list of something and returns a list of something else. Um, and um, here in this example, on this slide, I'm going to try to define the G function that removes the minimum element of a list, right? So let's say you have a list of some elements, you want to drop the minimum element, should be easy enough to implement, right? Um, and the top F function does the same thing on sets. So it's how we would define it in a, in a pseudocode, um, uh, in a pseudocode algorithm, for example. Now, the key point of this diagram is now that this f and g functions, the f is the abstract function, g is the concrete function, need to be related somehow. Namely, if you run g on hardware and if you run f in mathematics, so to speak, the results must be comparable using this abstraction function. So if you um, call the abstraction function on g of x as the result of the concrete um, algorithm, you should get the result of the abstract algorithm back. And that sort of makes sense, right? So, um, of course, you want to implement the uh, textbook algorithm faithfully. Now, um, let's take a look at some examples. Um, we take the list of 3 to 1 and want to remove the 1. Um, I've omitted the implementation of the Haskell function here. If you want to do it, there's probably a library function to do that. So, don't mind that. But we remove the minimum element. So, if we uh, take 3 to 1, no matter the order, we should get the list 3, 2 back and the one should be dropped. And now we can compare this with the abstract version where we would just take S and then remove the minimum from that using the uh, backslash 
notation, which is kind of the, the set difference, um, we also do the same thing. So we, this should be simple enough. We have the set one, two, three, and then we drop the one and get the set two, three back. And now we check um, if we run alpha on the list three, two, we get the set two, three back. Cool. Um, what if we change this around slightly? So what if we duplicate the minimum element of the list? Well, then we already notice that the set doesn't care that there's a duplicate. So it just gets removed all the instances of this one. Um, but our G function in the implementation also needs to do that. So our G function needs to take care of the fact that there might be duplicate elements in the list. Now, let's say the G function was co uh, implemented incorrectly and we only drop the one, but not both ones. So you would get the result three to one back. Then it would be a violation of this abstraction function. So this is something really that we need to take care of. And here's another catch. What if we start out with the empty list? Now, maybe a naive implementation of this G function would throw an error, uh, but it actually needs to return the list unchanged because um, if you take the empty set, you can remove anything. It doesn't really matter. It, you can remove five, you can remove um, apples. It doesn't matter. You always get the empty set back. So no matter what you attempt to remove from the empty set, you have the empty set. So that means that your G function, the concrete implementation, uh, needs to return the empty list unchanged. Right? So we can do this for all sorts of operations on, on sets and lists. So there could be another operation that increments all the elements by one, for example. There could be an operation that um, divides each element by two. There could be something that inserts something and so on. Um, and you can judge the validity of an implementation based on this kind of diagram where you compare the results of f and g and make sure that they are corresponding. We can define this now slightly more formally. So we can say that a concrete function g that maps lists to lists is a valid implementation of f, which is this abstract thing that maps sets to sets, um, if and only if, so we need the following conditions to hold, if for every list of x, every list, that we have every list axis, it holds that if you first apply g to axis and then call alpha on it, so you first do the concrete mapping, then you abstract away, it should be the same as if you first abstract away and then do the abstract mapping. So these are basically the two paths uh, to, through this diagram. So in the end, you can take go from the bottom left corner, then go to the top left and then to the top right or you can start on the bottom left, go to the bottom right, and then the top right. Those two paths that you have in a diagram, they should be equivalent to each other. If all of these conditions are satisfied, we can also say that G refines F. So that means that F is some kind of abstract idea, and then G is a refinement that implements it on uh, nitty gritty details. Um, uh, and it turns out that there can also be multiple of these refinement steps. So you could start out with um, you could start out with these unordered sets, then you could refine to ordered sets, and then you can refine to hash sets, and so on. So there can be multiple layers in that. And um, just to uh, make this uh, uh, even more. Um, um, just to make this even more visual, uh, I have a slide here that shows this alpha function on um, a particular uh, set of input lists and then the resulting um, abstractions. And you can see here again that even if you duplicate elements or switch around the order, uh, the resulting set would be the same. Okay, so just to summarize, um, we have this concrete function g, it refines the abstract function f because related inputs are mapped to related outputs, right? So if the inputs are related, then the outputs also need to be related. And we can also write this um, in a mathematical formula. So we can say that if the inputs X and Y are related by alpha, then also the outputs G and F of uh, X and Y need also to be related by alpha. Um, and it turns out that if some additional property is satisfied, namely with that alpha is injective, um, we can use this to automatically define G. Now the details for this are not important, but I just want to mention here that if we have 
some additional knowledge about the alpha function, uh, we can use tools to actually go from an abstract algorithm directly to a concrete implementation. So we don't need to do that manually. However, there are a few challenges, of course. Um, so there's no free lunch. Um, imagine you have a textbook algorithm that says, pick any element X from S. How are you going to implement it on lists, right? Which one would you pick? Would you pick the first, the last, uh, the median, the, the, the smallest, the largest? How do you do, how do you know that? Um, what if alpha is not injective? So what if you um, don't know any additional properties about alpha? What if alpha is partial? So what if you have some kind of illegal representations that cannot be mapped to some kind of um, abstract idea? So all of these things have to be considered um, and but how, how they are kind of implemented in reality would be outside of the scope of this talk, but I just want to mention uh, that there's a bit of a, there's, there's some challenges around here. Now, what are the use cases of, of this entire idea? So as I mentioned, you can talk about program refinement. So they started with a textbook algorithm and then you um, sort of derive a concrete implementation from that. And the second thing is really interesting. Um, it's called abstract interpretation. It's what your compiler does when it tries to figure out if you have some kind of high level defects in your code. So in Java, for example, you can uh, try to figure out if you have uh, some potential uh, null pointer exceptions going on somewhere. And in order to do that, your compiler will set, will, will kind of look at every operation that you do in your program and try to abstract away from the concrete stuff that's going on. It just tries to understand null or non-null. So it kind of abstracts away from your concrete values, like, uh, I don't know, strings, and just separates into two classes. You have the non-null stuff and you have the null stuff. And then it just tries to figure out if the null stuff bleeds somewhere where you wouldn't expect it. So if you call a function on something that could potentially be null. Um, this can also be applied to division by zero, for example. So you can basically divide all the numbers into zero. That could be integer zero, could be short zero, could be float zero and so on, and all the other numbers. And then if you try to do a division by something that could potentially be zero, then you might have a defect in your code. Um, uh, there's a whole area of research behind this kind of abstract interpretation and it's uh, really interesting how to implement that if you have while loops and like all of these control structures, um, how this works out. But all of this abstraction business is really, really important uh, for this use case. And then finally, we have uh, the notion of parametricity. And this is what I'm going to talk about now in the second half of this talk, because it is what paves the way to the theme for free concept. Now, uh, what, what is parametricity? Um, the, there's some mathematics left in this talk, but by far not as detailed as before. So uh, whoever's interested in the nitty gritty details can read the paper by John Reynolds. Um, but here I'm going to focus now on uh, what we do as Haskell programmers. So the Haskell's whole clause says, it kind of common wisdom, uh, the more type variables, the merrier. Um, so if you can abstract away some concrete types and replace them by type variables, you should do that. It's good, right? So everybody knows this, um, but do we actually understand why we say this? And uh, of course, this is um, uh, this is a consequence of this concept theorems for free. And some people take it to the extreme. So just as an example, when I started out with Haskell, lenses were just pairs of functions of getter and setter. And nowadays, um, well, actually, I think nowadays it's even more abstract, but now you have this kind of structure with, with uh, five different type variables going on here. And um, I will try to take the remaining amount of the talk to explain um, why we do this, why we abstract uh, to that extent. Um, and for that, it is important to know that um, we have a connection between Haskell types and the sets I mentioned from earlier, from, from set theory, because every type can be thought as the set of the possible values that they can take um, at runtime. So for example, if we take a look at the bool type, um, it can have two values, true and false. And we, um, we, we use these kind of funny brackets, uh, they are also sometimes called denotational brackets, uh, to talk about the denotation of the type. So we can look at just the 
type syntax like bool or integer, and then we can look at what possible values uh, this type can have. Um, the integer type in Haskell, of course, is all the um, ints, so they can be of arbitrary size or potentially unbounded. Uh, we can also look at um, pairs, and you know, pairs in Haskell are also pairs um, at runtime. And we can also take a look, for example, at functions. So if we look at the denotation of the function arrow, then it would be the set of all functions that send values from A to values of B. Um, and not only that, but we can also assign to every type a relation. So remember the definition of relation. We can, uh, we can um, sort of relate values from one type to it themselves, so to speak. So this relation would be a subset of, this, uh, uh, of, of the denotation of T with itself. Now, why do we define all of this stuff? Um, I, I mean, I, the, the paper by Reynolds goes into really, really a lot of detail, but um, why do we do all this? Well, Reynolds proved a theorem and it's called the parametricity theorem. And it says that if you have any term, uh, so I think he uses some form of lambda calculus, but we can also think of Haskell types here. So if T is some kind of Haskell types, which is closed, so it does, cannot reference any uh, unbound variables, then this value t is related to itself. And that sounds really strange, right? So every term is related to itself. What does it, what does it tell us? It's, it's just sounds like a stupid theorem, right? Why would you prove that kind of thing? Well, it has actually a lot of consequences. Um, allow me to make this more concrete. So let's say we have a function on lists. Um, I call this function fropnicate and um, it just takes a list of a's and returns a list of a's. Um, the Shropnicate function could shuffle the values, it could drop some values, but the important point is it returns the same kind of values as it has received. Um, now the parametricity theorem says that Shropnicate is somehow related to itself according to some magic relation that I'm not going to define here because it's very complicated, um, but this is the theorem on, on Shropnicate and now the consequence of the theorem is that we can prove the following fact. Um, we can prove that if we first map something over the input of Frobnicate, it's the same thing as if we run Frobnicate first and then map. In other words, Frobnicate and map can be swapped around in this equation. Uh, and that's really interesting. It's not exactly obvious, right? Um, and the reason why we can prove this is basically because Frobnicate does not know anything about the structure of the arguments it receives. It can reshuffle the arguments, it can drop them, it can reverse them, whatever, but it cannot look at the actual values themselves. So list of A, it could be a list of strings, it could be a list of ints, it could be a list of functions, it could be a list of whatever. And in particular, Frobnicate cannot invent new values of A because it doesn't know what A is. And because of that fact, we can prove that you can either first Frobnicate and then map, or you can first map and then fromnicate. And this is a consequence of this parametricity theorem. And the last line in this um, slide is what the paper by Philip Wadler is about. So the, the idea here is really that you can just take a look at the type signature of fromnicate, which is list of A to list of A, and then you can derive the result at the bottom of this. And the justification is in the middle because you have this complicated parametricity stuff going on with all the abstraction functions, relations, and, and so on. But you get some very, very real consequences for your real world Haskell code. Okay, now, so now what? What, what have we done with this? Um, so I hope after listening to this talk, maybe you, um, you've heard about all of that business with the reasoning about types and so on before, but maybe you didn't really know uh, what that was about or what you can reason with that. And, and afterwards, you might be able to just, you know, uh, look at all your Haskell functions and be very smart and, and know all about this now. The bottom line is here that we can reason about types. And the reason we can do that is because functions that have type variables, they don't know anything and they can't do much, right? This is what I tried to explain earlier. Um, if you have an A as an input or as an output, you don't know what that A is. So it um, can be anything, and because you don't know, you can't do anything with it. Um, in practice, uh, we can uh, do stuff like prove that the second functor law is redundant. So 
functor in Haskell is a very foundational concept and they have two laws. The first law is that if you call fmap with the identity function, you get the identity function back. Um, and this means, for example, for lists, if you map on a list with the identity function, nothing is changed, just returns the original list back. Uh, the second functor law says that if you map a thing with the composition of f and g, so you first apply g and then apply f, um, you can do that either in one map operation or you can do it in two map operations. So you can first map g and then you can map f. So those two things um, are the same. And this is written in the definition of the functor type class. So every time you implement functor, you need to make sure that those laws hold. And in practice, it turns out that the second functor law is not actually needed. You just need to prove that this identity law holds. And then based on this entire parametricity uh, free theorems concept, you can already derive the second functor law. So it's not actually needed um, to do that manually. Um, and if you want to look at something more concrete from your code, maybe, uh, there's a tool that's just called Free Theorems, and it's um, on Joachim Breitner's website. And you can enter some kind of type. Um, here we have the type of filter. So filter is a function that takes a predicate, a to bool, and then another list, and returns a list of the same type. And the idea is that if a filter goes through all the elements in this list, calls the predicate on each element, if the predicate is true, the, the element stays in. If the predicate is false, it is being filtered out. And then you can um, uh, just type in that signature and get the theorems back um, on this function. And um, I encourage you to play around with it a little bit. You can uh, sort of do some uh, uh, configuration there, but in the end, you will get um, um, you will get a theorem that can be could be directly checked with quick check, for example, and you will find that it's true. Um, here's another free theorem. Um, so if you have a function that um, has this type, and you might recognize this type, uh, we can prove that this function is either map directly, so it's directly the map function as you find in a library, or it's map with rearrangement, so it could do a reverse, or it could always return the empty list, for example. But crucially, it cannot return any other elements than map would. So we cannot just invent any new bees here on the spot. Right, so all of these theorems can be derived from your uh, polymorphic type signatures. All is cool and well. Unfortunately, um, non-termination um, destroys, well, almost everything. So in practice, like if you actually look at how Haskell is implemented, um, your functions can also return nothing. They could just not return anything. They could just loop forever. Um, in that case, your theorems will be strictly limited. Um, for example, the free theorem on, on map function would have an additional restriction that the f that you put in there um, should be terminating for all the inputs. So we can repair these theorems but uh, it comes at a cost. And the bottom line here is that you should try to avoid non-termination and all of that stuff um, because otherwise your guarantees of your functions are just not as good as otherwise. There's a couple of other um, extensions uh, we can look at. So for example, type classes. I have not talked about type classes at all because they also complicate things. Um, so what does it mean concretely? Um, let's use, for example, the nub function. Um, the nub function takes a list and returns a list that has all the duplicates filtered out. Um, and the duplicates are, the duplicates are uh, um, detected using the Haskell equals function, which is defined in an EQ type class. Uh, and normally, um, based on free theorems, the function would not be allowed to do that because it cannot compare two A's. But because we have this EQ constraint, the function basically gains additional power. It can gain more insight into the values it receives. Or take, for example, the sort function. It takes an ordering, an ord A constraint, and it now it can return the elements in an increasing order. This would also normally not be allowed um, by the free theorem. And we can fix this. We can just add additional restrictions to the free theorems because um, these type class constraints are in the end just values, additional values that you can pass into this function. And in the, in the case of EQ, um, you pass 
um, equality function into your function. So it suddenly becomes some form of higher order function and all of this can be dealt with um, in the free theorem framework. Um, and basically this means is that in, in Haskell you can model these type classes as uh, dictionaries of records that you can pass in. Um, of course it becomes more complicated when your uh, type classes are themselves polymorphic or are classes on constructor, for example, monad. Um, if your function takes a monad constraint, stuff gets a lot more complicated. But uh, there's research on, on this. Um, if I remember correctly, Wadlow's original paper doesn't mention it. Um, but all of these things can be worked around and integrated into the framework. There's um, current research on, on these type constructor classes and so on. Um, but yeah, anyway, I encourage you to um, play around with the free theorems tool by Joachim Breitner on, on his website. And um, yeah, maybe next time you write a polymorphic function in Haskell, we remember, well, if I only have this type signature, then I get these kinds of guarantees and I don't need to write tests for that because it's already in the type signature. And that concludes my talk um, and I'm very happy to take any questions now.